Um, as usual, I want to thank my mother Amen. for yes. maintaining her perfect win streak All right, mother. <laughs> and showing up for yet another event that her oldest boy has decided to embark upon. I don't know if, if, if I can convey this message clearly, but just the whole concept of having a consistent and a dependable support Amen. is something that is to be treasured and to be honored. So to my mother, I say I love you and I Amen. thank you, um, not only for being the support, but also setting the standard yeah. for the woman that I married. All right. Because when she told me that she wanted to be a stay-at-home mom when she grew up, we, we, we were done investigating whether or not this was it. Mm. So to my wife, I just want to say thank you for everything that you have done for Amen. me. Amen. Because Amen. where I am today, it is absolutely impossible outside of God's sovereignty and miraculous hand for me to stand before you without you. Amen. So I thank you as well. Awesome. And so um, the word of God has already been read to you. Um, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. there's benefit of the struggle. There's benefit of the struggle. Look at your other neighbor and say, neighbor, there's benefits in the struggle. There's benefit in the struggle. Let's pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you, Father God. We thank you for another day. We thank you for another opportunity to assemble freely and of our own free will, Father God, to come together as like-minded believers, to assemble with one another, to worship you, Father God. And Lord, I must confess that I am nothing without you, Father God. Without you, I am nothing but two fish and five loaves of bread. So I offer it to you, Father. Yes. Lord, I ask that you would multiply it, that you would bless it, and that you would feed your sheep, Father God. Father God, it's my prayer here this morning, that you would use this crooked stick to draw straight lines, Father God. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in my, in my leisure time, if you were to examine my Instagram Explore tab, there's two common things that you will see uh, permeating through my Explore tab. First things first is going to be all things running. Um, having completed a marathon last year, it has been uh, rather consuming in its endeavors. But the other thing that most people don't know, that my uh, Explore tab is filled with high-altitude mountaineering. I don't understand why. I really can't give you a thorough explanation as to why I like to spend my time looking at the 14 tallest mountain peaks in the world, but that's where I find myself um, enjoying my, my, my off time. Most of you are aware that the tallest mountain in the world is Mount Everest. The, the thing about climbing Mount Everest is you can't just decide one day that I'm just going to uh, climb up Mount Everest. There's an actual process that you have to undergo. It's not just about funding, it is not just about uh, training, but even with all the training, with all the funding, there's still a process from when you get to the airport before you get to the mountain. As soon as you step off the airplane, you're starting at an altitude of 9,200 9, feet. And before you begin climbing this magnificent piece of rock, the base camp altitude sits at 17,598 feet. Now there's a little bit of a process. You can't just make that trip all at one time. You need a minimum of eight to 10 hours of rest for every thousand feet you climb in elevation. And the whole time that you're doing this, you're carrying a backpack that weighs anywhere from 50 to 80 pounds. So in order to stand at the base of the mountain, mind you, this is not even a single step on the rock, you have to hike for at least 10 to 14 days. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, and at least, uh, let me rephrase. This is what I was thinking. <laughs> it don't take all that. 
why, why, why do you have to spend, now from a, a GPS standpoint, that trip takes about two to three days. Now, most coaches and, uh, and guides for this trek, they recommend that you walk there because your body has to acclimate to functioning with less available oxygen in the atmosphere. And the, the other reason it's recommended and not required because you can, in fact, go straight to the base of the mountain. But the problem is, the closer you get to the base of the mountain, you begin to suffer the effects of high altitude sickness. Some of those symptoms include headaches, mm -hmm. feeling and actually being sick, dizziness, tiredness, loss of appetite, and in fact, shortness of breath. I share all of that to say that these symptoms begin to develop because you are in a place that your body is not prepared to sustain you in. I'll say that again. It says that the symptoms that begin to develop because you are in a place that your body is not prepared to sustain you in. Mm. So in other words, while it's not mandated, it is recommended that the safest way to complete this journey to the base of the mountain, even though it's uncomfortable, even though it's not preferred, in order to endure this hike, you have to, in fact, suffer your way through. As believers, it is not an unreason it's not unreasonable to want to fast track through our hardships. If we're being honest, and I can honestly say this, that we all share in this sentiment, we'd much rather avoid it altogether. And scripture shows that we're not alone in this thought process because in Mark 14, uh, verses 36 through 40, we see that Jesus prayed to the Father three times. Mm -hmm. And he said, I, I, I would rather not do this. As a matter of fact, if you, if, if you got some knowledge that you're holding from me and you would like to share how this can be done without me going to this cross and breaking fellowship with you, I would prefer to do that. But it also shows that Jesus says, yet not my will, but your will be done. And so even though there are stories in scripture that show the prosperity and the avoidance of hard times, I believe that the Bible makes it clear that those stories are more of the exception, rather it is the norm. Not only are they the norm, it would appear that, su that scripture suggests that the struggles and the hard times are God's go-to method for his children to grow. <coughs> so as we, break into, um, as we break into this text, in the previous chapter, we see that Paul makes the case for the church in Corinth has been boasting in all the wrong things for all the wrong reasons. In, ver in chapter 11, verse 32, Paul says, you guys are bragging about being Hebrews. He says, so am I. He says, you guys are bragging about Israelites. He says, so am I. He says, you guys are bragging about being the descendants of Abraham. And he <coughs> says, guess what? Me too. And, but Paul, Paul makes a pivot in chapter 12. He says, truthfully, we really shouldn't be spending too much time bragging about those things. But if we're going to brag, let me show you how to do this thing correctly. <laughs> Paul says, I was whipped 39 times, or I'm sorry, 39 lashes five times. He says, I was beaten with rods three times. He said, I was stoned. I was shipwrecked three times. I traveled to go through dangerous cities and around dangerous people. Said, I've been lied on. I've been exhausted. I've been hungry. And I even had to be lowered out of a window of a city mm. to escape being captured. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then in, then in chapter 12, Paul drops his big joker. He says, I now have a thorn in my flesh for the rest of my life. Mm. Now, cue the record scratch. By now, you've probably realized that this is not exactly um, the ESPN top 10 list of things we should, we should be bragging about. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, by the world standards, this is arguably the worst top, top 10 list ever made. So as why is Paul giving us this, this best of the worst things that can ever happen to a human as something to brag about. <coughs> and I submit to you, my brothers and sisters, that Paul is getting ready to lay the framework to say there is benefit to your suffering. Mm. 
And in the time I have, re- the time I have remaining, Paul gives us four benefits to our suffering. Starting in verse 7, Paul says that suffering restores humility. Yes. It says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me and to keep me from exalting myself. Suffering has a way of preventing us from developing a God complex. If you think I'm not telling the truth, take a look over to Daniel chapter 4, verses 30 and 31. Uh Here we see that Nebuchadnezzar decides that he wants to have a conversation with himself about all the things that he accomplished. In verse 30, Nebuchadnezzar says, Then the the king reflected and said, Is it not Babylon the, the great? which I myself have built as a royal residence by my might and my power and for the glory of my majesty. King Nebuchadnezzar says, you know what? I I said this to myself. I said, self, myself said, hmm? (laughs) This is a great kingdom that you've made. But God had to come in. And he said, while the words were yet, I like like the King James. The King James says, while the words were yet in his mouth, A voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared the sovereignty has been removed from you. Mm. Now fast forward over to verses uh, 34 and 37. 34 says, but at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the most high and praised and honored him who lives forever. Now, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven, for all of his works are true and his ways are just, and he is able to humble those that walk in pride. I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but God shares his glory with no one and is willing to do anything and everything that is necessary to separate you from his glory. So Paul has this situation. Paul has been to heaven. He has experienced everything that has taken place in heaven, and he's still alive to tell the story. Can you imagine how that must feel to exist in time, to have experienced what can only be experienced in eternity? Now, the theological house is rather divided on whether this thorn was literal or figurative. But regardless of what type of thorn it was, the message is clear. God will sometimes hurt us in order to help us. I know that's kind of tight. I, I, listen, I know this doesn't line up with the name it and claim it. I know this doesn't line up with all the oracles and the chakras and, 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 and all these premeditations. But at the end of the day, God will in fact hurt you in order to help you. Okay, so maybe you don't know what I'm talking about. So y'all remember that job that you prayed for? They said, God, if you just get me this job, I'll be able to pay my bills. And I, look, I'll even give you more than 10%. And then all of a sudden you get that job and then all of a sudden we don't see you at church no more. And so what God ends up doing is all of a sudden, them hours get cut. All of a sudden that car note starts looking like a burden. All of a sudden, that mortgage starts stressing you out every 30 days because it's got to get paid. Y'all remember that car that you prayed for? God, I'm tired of getting rides with everybody. I'm tired of riding a bus. God, if you just give me a car, I promise I'm going to do right. And all of a sudden, that car start wobbling after you drive over 30 miles an hour because you ain't been to church in six months. The thorn was necessary for him because he had to remember that even though he saw God's majesty, he still is no better than the next man. And so when we understand that suffering restores our humility, number two, we see that suffering redirects our focus. Mm 
In verse 8, oh, excuse me. In verse 8, it says, concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. Now, unfortunately, we read scripture today, and we read it with what, what I like to call our English glasses on. Because what, what tends to happen is that we miss the intensity of this prayer that Paul was having with God. This was not one of those, God, could really use your help right now. This, this, this ailment that you've given me is really being a pain in my butt. And it would be oh so convenient if you can get rid of this thing. No, Paul was having an intense fellowship with God. The only thing that I can imagine this being like is when my wife woke up after having a hysterectomy. This was some of the most intense, the most focused conversation that I've ever heard one person have with God to remove this pain. There was, there, was, there was some wheeling and dealing. There was some bargaining. There was a whole bunch of, if you do this, I'll do this. But at the end of the day, it was like, God, I need this pain gone. And that's what Paul is trying to communicate right now. Because too many times, we treat God like a spare tire. We drive around. We enjoy the, the vehicle that we're supposed to be letting God drive for us. But we're sitting in the driver's seat. We're going to and fro, putting gas in it. We're making sure them tans are clean, though. But you know what I'm saying? We got to make sure. Got to make sure the shoes are right. We got to get the car wash on Friday. But then when we get a tire to blow out, we don't even know how to get the spare tire down. And if we really tell the truth, we're going to have to call AAA because we know where it's at, but it's stuck. And so here we are on the side of I-55, banging and clanging on this tire, trying to get it down while cars are whooshing by, and we just out here looking for help. Oftentimes, we treat God like an insurance policy. You know how insurance policies work. You show up every month, you make your payments, and when you, you, you don't expect problems to happen, but in the event that they do, all you got to do is make one phone call and they run to make sure that you're up to date and you get a rental car. How many times have we treated God like he's done even exist until we run into a little bit of trouble? All of a sudden we got more month than money and now we need God to come through with a miracle. All of a sudden we start telling God, if you just let this check stretch, I promise you I'll tithe with the rest. But see, our prayers are often pleasant when everything is fine. But as soon as we get smacked in the face, we tend to tap into those Southern Baptist prayers. You know, the ones that Big Mama used to pray laid on her face in her prayer closet. Because we, need, we don't need God now. We need God right now. And if he's willing, we could use him yesterday. And so not only do we see that suffering redirects our focus, beloved, the third benefit to suffering is that suffering reinforces dependency. Verse 9 says, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Now, I'm not a Greek, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I got a little, I got some definitions for you. You're not going to get a, a pronunciation out of me. Two words I want to look at, the word sufficient and the word perfect. Sufficient means to be able to bear so there's no need to remove the object that you need gone. What God is saying to Paul is that I got something better for you than removing this thorn. I'm going to give you my power to bear it. Now, when I think about that, it's like, God, I hear you. But I, 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 I would be okay if this thing was gone. Like, I, like I, listen, being able to bear it is wonderful, but I would very much like this thing to be over with. Those last three miles, 
Those last three miles of the marathon last year, I was, look, 23 miles accomplished, doing good. My support team was sitting around the corner. Oh, we did some high fives. I got to kiss my wife. I got to slap fives with my kids. I got around that corner, and as soon as I couldn't see nobody, it was like, well, oh, all of a sudden, them hamstrings got tight. No, oh, them feet got the swelling and got the throbbing, and it didn't take long before I had reconciled with myself. I said, self? Myself said, hmm? I said, I, I, I could really stop now. I'm, I'm, I'm really okay if you don't finish. Listen, nobody is going to be mad because everybody that's going to see me and ask me if I finish, and I say no, they're going to be like, brother, that's 24 miles and I've done all year. And this is October. But, the end of, but at the end of the day, having that conversation with God while I'm trying to finish this marathon, I said, God, my feet hurt. My legs hurt. I'm dehydrated. I'm hungry. I'm really ready to be done. The amazing thing is that God will give you the strength to deal with your pain, not so that it goes away, but it doesn't have, a, it doesn't have control over the thoughts and the decisions that you make. And so not only do we see that God's grace is sufficient, but God's grace is also perfect. Now that word perfect is slightly different than the perfect that we see in the book of James. The book of James talks about perfection being a completed act that's independent of external factors. This word perfect that we see in 2 Corinthians talks about adding to what is lacking in order to make something complete. So you know what that means, right? You have to be at the end of your rope in order to experience this power that God has for you. And a lot of times we start going through life and we want God to move on our behalf, but we're too busy trying to do God's job for him. And so what Paul is saying is I get excited about being weak because I get to experience a strength. I get to experience a move on God's behalf and I get to participate in it because where I am at the end of my rope, God is just getting warmed up. And so what we know is that God will feed us where he leads us and that he protects us where he directs us and he provides for us where he guides for us. And if you don't believe me, ask the people of Israel where they wondered about in the wilderness for 40 years and never lost an article of clothing, never wore through a sole on their shoe. They never went thirsty and they never went hungry. Amen. So we've seen that suffering has three benefits so far. We see that suffering restores our humility. It redirects our focus and it reinforces dependency forth and finally we see that suffering reconstructs our perspective. In verse 10, it says, Therefore, I am well content with weakness, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with, diffic with difficulties, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. That, that well content means to take pleasure in. Now, hold on, Paul. You mean to tell me that I have to be excited and delighted about the pain and the suffering that I'm going through. I would submit to you, the answer is no. You don't have to be delighted. He's not saying you should be delighted about the problem. He's saying you should be delighted in the problem solver. He's saying that you shouldn't be excited about the dilemma. He's saying that you should be excited about the advocate. He's not saying you should be excited about the issue. He's saying that you should be excited that you have a, a chief shepherd who cares for just you and me. And so he says, by no means is Paul excited about the pain that he's experiencing. He's just excited about God's power in the presence of his own weakness. In Romans chapter 12, Paul admonishes us to present ourselves as living sacrifices, as a reasonable service. What's amazing about that is that a living sacrifice moves. And that means we have to lay ourselves down and we have to stay there. And what that reasonable service is, that's like a cup of coffee to God. Imagine you massed with student loan debt. 
and God go ahead and swipes his black card, and he says, good, look, student loans, they're paid off. So every time you see God, the very least you can do is get him a cup of coffee. The very least you can do is see if he's hungry. And what God is saying, laying our lives down as a living sacrifice is but a cup of coffee to God. And so what ends up happening is that when you go through these hardships, when you go through these struggles, when you come out on the other side, you see that God is still faithful. It's, it's, it's impossible to see that God is a healer if you've never been sick. It's impossible to see that God will advocate for you if you've never been accused of anything. And unfortunately, the only way to experience these things is to go through these things. And the only way for us to know that God is able is that he has to be able to do it. And it's ironic that two years ago, we sat here and we told everybody to pray for us. And Abigail Rose started going through her chemo journey. And and to this day, I don't understand how God did it, but I know that he did. Because before it all started, we said that no matter what, our family comes first. So when it came time to do chemo, the question was, was I going to work was I, or, or was I staying home? Fortunately, we had the savings account that said, eh, we got about three months. But I submit to you that we didn't touch that savings for six whole months. I ended up having to do fa- uh, FAFSA for, for, for my oldest and saw that I made $20,000 less than what I normally make, and not a light flickered, the water didn't sputter, there was gas in the car, and God is still faithful. So I know there's a question out there as I prepare to take my seat. Why do we gotta do this? Why, I mean, why, 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 why suffer? I mean, this was a question that we talked about in Bible study a few weeks ago. I mean, like, yeah, you know, like, I I, I get the theory, I get the principle, but the question is, isn't there another way? Like, 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 can we be real for a second? Like, Like, I don't think anybody really has a problem with the process, but the question is like, if God is all powerful, all knowing, ever present, ever loving, There's no other way. (laughs) But the question is, why? I would submit to you because of free will. Because truth be told, we see in Genesis 1 and 2, God had a very simple plan for us. He said, but because we wanted more, we ended up with less. Listen, every single time, In scripture, we are left to ourselves. We muster all of the might and power to choose to do the wrong thing. If you don't believe me, we start in the beginning. We chose the fruit in the garden. We chose the golden calf in the wilderness. We chose to stay, we chose to stay outside of the promised land versus going in. We chose to strike the rock when we were supposed to speak to it. And we even chose to have our own king. And listen, we always choose to do our own thing. And contrary to popular belief, I have to disagree with Dr. Martin Luther King. I do not believe that man is bent towards goodness. I think we have a natural bend towards doing whatever is right in our own eyes. And yet, God looked at his creation and said, I can work with that. Looking at his creation, he said, he chose to give us clothes to hide our shame. He chose to give us an altar for our worship. He chose to give us protection during a 40-year punishment. He chose to give us a view from the promised land when we couldn't step foot in it. And he chose to give us the one true king that wrapped himself in flesh, that was born of a virgin, that existed as fully God, fully man, never mixing of the two, died a human death, rose from the grave, and we can be thankful and trust that God will return again. 
And while God could absolutely change our circumstances in the blink of an eye, the reality is that he uses the consequences of our choice so that we will choose him. Let's pray.